So, 10 years have come and gone, and the video game industry has changed. I always think the end of a decade makes for a good time to look back and reflect. The changes we don't notice in a single year can become stark over the passage of 10, as the endless march of progress forges on. But the progress of the 2010s isn't so much that of the technological growth which so characterised previous decades for the industry, but instead more one of evolving markets and shifting economies. And this progress has come with some downsides. So, the last 10 years have been a little bit tumultuous. It's been a decade of highs and lows, of successes and failures, and the fall of one thing that's been met by the rise of another. So, join me for a trip down memory lane as we look back at the decade in video games. Before we get to this decade, I feel we need to set the scene, so let's go back another 10 years to look at the start of the previous one. 2000 and 2001 saw the release of the sixth console generation, which saw new advancements like the utilisation of online services, as well as a big step up for graphics, and of course, lots of good games. Just take a look at this advert from Sony for their 2001 holiday lineup of exclusive games. This is one part of one year for one console, and just the games shown here are pretty incredible. These were games that changed gaming. Grand Theft Auto 3 completely reinvented the open world genre, and its legacy is still being felt today. Metal Gear Solid 2 remains one of the most memorable narrative experiences you'll find in a game. Silent Hill 2 could easily be considered as the greatest horror game ever made. Devil May Cry again spawned its own genre that still has many die-hard fans today, and I could go on here. It's also worth noting that other consoles had their own important games in 2001. Xbox had Halo, the GameCube had Super Smash Bros Melee, and so on. These were big budget games with high production values, and the range of different things and overall level of quality of what was on offer was fantastic. And when you compare pretty much any year of the early 2000s with pretty much any year from this past decade, there's a clear difference. Once upon a time, big budget games were usually good, and now they're often disappointing. Once upon a time, gamers seemed pretty content with AAA gaming, and now they're not. And once upon a time, mainstream gaming was great, and now it isn't. But don't just take my word for it, I have evidence. First up, what about the critical reception of games from these periods? Let's take two years from the start of the last decade, 2001 and 2, and two from the end of this decade, 2017 and 18, and compare how many games got a Metacritic score of 90 and above. For 2001, there are 38 games. For 2002, there are 35. And this is excluding ports and only counting a game once, even if it's listed for multiple consoles. So, 38 and 35 sound fairly impressive, but 2017 was a decent year for games, so how does it compare? Well, continuing the rules of excluding ports, there are 7 games with a critic score of 90 or higher for 2007, and 7 again for 2018, which is a pretty big difference. If you think I'm cherry picking the years here, I'm not. In fact, 2019 seems to have only four, but feel free to check this all yourself, and if you're curious how the start of the last decade compares, it's, maybe unsurprisingly, somewhere in between. But maybe you could say critics are dumb and don't know what they're talking about, or maybe you could argue standards have changed in the review scores, so let's look at something else. If you don't want to rely on the word of critics, why not look at user scores? I can't find a nice pre-made table presenting this information, so I guess I'll have to make one myself. So, let's take the 10 biggest games by sales from 2001 and 2, and compare their user scores to the 10 biggest games from 2018 and 19. These are my sources, and these are the results. 
from an average of 8.1 and 8.6 in 2001 and 2, to 6.4 in 2018, and 4.9 in 2019. So, just as before, there is a pretty clear difference. If you're still not convinced, then I don't know, I think that's on you, because I made an Excel chart, and as we all know, red is a lot worse than green. Also, there's only so much time I can spend on this section of the video, because really the best evidence is the games themselves. And when you compare this decade to previous decades, there's just less classics than there used to be. It's not that good games don't exist anymore, it's just that they feel rarer, that you need to actually search for them, and that you can't rely on the fact that a game has a big budget or a well-known publisher as any kind of indication of quality. And when looking at the last decade as a whole, and thinking about what's changed, and what sets this decade apart from what came before, this is one of the most prominent things. AAA titles, mainstream gaming, large publishers, they're all failing to deliver, and people are taking note of this, with the animosity from consumers towards producers steadily increasing as the decade has rolled on. So, why has this happened? Well, firstly, technological progress isn't what it used to be. Compare the graphical improvements of the 90s or 2000s with that of the 2010s, and the difference speaks for itself. The previous decade saw Grand Theft Auto going from this to this, and that's quite the leap forward, enough to make the jump from GTA 4 to 5 seem pretty lacklustre. Ten years is a long time, but rather than bringing a complete graphical transformation, it's only brought very gradual improvements. Once upon a time, the jump from, say, Metal Gear Solid 1 to Metal Gear Solid 2 blew my mind. I genuinely couldn't believe games looked this good, and these two games released only three years apart. But now, over the course of three years, I feel like I barely notice a difference, because the speed at which graphics and technology has improved has slowed considerably, and now games can't rely on technological advancements to wow players, or make a sequel feel like a sequel. And even though improvements in technology have slowed, the costs of making a game have done anything but. As game technology has got bigger and better, so too has its demands. Let's compare some beloved Nintendo classics from back in the day, like Super Mario World and Super Metroid, to some of the impressive games of recent years. Both Super Mario World and Super Metroid took around two years to develop, with Super Mario World being developed by a staff of 10, and Super Metroid having 15. That seems quite modest, but hey, they were able to make some good games that still hold up well today. But now let's look at some recent AAA titles, like God of War and Red Dead Redemption 2. Both took around 5 years to develop, with 300 people reportedly working on God of War, and a colossal 2,000 people working on Red Dead Redemption 2. Something that seems extreme, even by modern standards. But if any modern game has come close to wowing graphically, then I guess it is Red Dead Redemption 2. So. Maybe that's what it takes these days. Regardless, the cost of employing hundreds, let alone thousands of people for several years, on top of every other business expense, is not going to be a small amount. Modern game development is expensive, and as the years have went by, that's only become more and more true. And if making big AAA games is going to have such a high cost, then that's going to have other effects. The first of which is that game publishers are going to look for ways to mitigate those costs by increasing a game's revenue, like by making downloadable content to reuse assets, or add in microtransactions to allow players to buy optional cosmetic items, convenience items, and pay to win improvements for their character, or by also following the wisdom of the gambling industry to introduce exciting luck-based reward systems for players willing to drop some coin in the form of loot boxes. And this is probably the biggest reason for why the user scores of so many high-selling modern games have fallen quite so low. 
While at the start of the decade microtransactions were rare, these days if a big budget game has multiplayer, it's going to have microtransactions, and there's a good chance that these will feature pay to win elements, as the boundaries for what people considered acceptable have continually been pushed further and further by modern video games. Perhaps the best known example of this was Electronic Arts Star Wars Battlefront 2, which released in 2017, and was the game that finally went too far by featuring both pay to win upgrades as well as excessively long grinds to unlock hero characters without the player splashing some cash about. Not only did this make players unhappy, that unhappiness also caused a media frenzy, resulting in EA's share price dropping by 2.5% on the game's launch. Despite this, Star Wars Battlefront 2 was still one of the best selling games of the year, while the boundaries of acceptability were stretched ever further as what was once considered outrageous became increasingly normalised. Perhaps even more surprising is the successful introduction of microtransactions into single player games. At least when it comes to multiplayer games, microtransactions were a thing before this decade began and, looking back, their growth seemed somewhat inevitable. Cash stores in single-player games, however, were something a lot of people didn't see coming. And yet, here we are. Things may have started with optional cosmetics, but they didn't stop there, as shown by Ubisoft's flagship series, Assassin's Creed, where the latest instalment combined grindy RPG systems with optional boosts for the player to purchase. For people not used to the idea of microtransactions in single-player games, stuff like this feels rather… unpalatable. But maybe it's good to get used to the taste now, because this seems like a thing that will continue in the future unless something drastic happens to the costs of game development or the mentality of publishers. But it doesn't stop there. Cash stores and loot boxes get a lot of attention, but they aren't the only consequence of modern games, modern costs. There's also been a clear change in what type of game gets made. In the past, you could look at the big releases of a year and see a wide range of different genres and styles. Let's go back to that image of the PlayStation 2's 2001 holiday lineup. Here we have a flight sim, an action RPG, a at the time completely original hack and slash action game, a turn based RPG, a racing game, a again completely original open world sandbox game, a puzzle adventure game, a platformer, a stealth game, and a survival horror game. And there isn't just a range of genres here, these games have completely different styles, tones, and are designed for radically different audiences. And it's not just that there were more genres on offer, games were also willing to be weirder to be more experimental, and to take real risks. You had games like Katamari Damacy, and Killer7, and Shadow of the Colossus, and these weren't treated as weird low-budget indie games, these titles sat on game store shelves alongside everything else as equals. And they had the high production values and established publishers and everything else they needed to really be equals. But by the start of the last decade, this was already starting to change, and this has only become truer as the decade continued. Because the greater the cost of making games, the greater the risk if they're unsuccessful. And so big budget games have become safer and safer. And so, there's a smaller range of genres, a more benign selection of settings, an ever-expanding desire to design games to hold the player's hand in case they get lost or stuck, and a greater reluctance to try out anything new, or original, or innovative. Generally speaking, most big budget games only get made if they're part of an existing series or franchise. Everything has to be a sequel or a reboot, and the only exceptions are games designed around following what sells as closely as possible, which at the moment seems to be action gameplay, light RPG mechanics, and either an open world or something more linear that's cinematic and narrative heavy. I mentioned reboots there, so I guess I should also talk about the rest of the four R's of the gaming apocalypse. Reboots, re-releases, remasters, and remakes and the 2010s have seen these four R's run rampant, because if you're worried about the economic risk of game development, well, it doesn't get much safer than literally just sticking with what worked in the past. 
So, in 2019, we have one of the four games with a Metacritic score of over 90 being a remake of Resident Evil 2. One of Nintendo's biggest releases of the year being a remake of The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening. One of the biggest MMO events of the entire decade being a re-release of World of Warcraft. And one of the biggest real-time strategy games to be released in years being a HD remaster of Age of the Empires 2. Keep in mind, we already had one HD remaster of this game already this decade, which was released in 2013, so this is the second re-release. A uh, re-re-release, if you like. But Age of the Empires 2 wasn't the only two-timer these last ten years. Shadow of the Colossus had a HD remaster released in 2011, and then a full remake in 2018, and GoldenEye 007, Metal Gear Solid 3, Catherine and Rockstar's Bully would all technically count as members of the two-time club as well. There were also many games released in the last decade which have already seen remasters, such as Assassin's Creed 3 and Brotherhood and Revelations. Bioshock 2, Batman Arkham City, Dark Souls, Darksiders 2, Dead Rising 2, DMC Devil May Cry, Donkey Kong Country Returns, and we're four letters into the alphabet and this list is already getting pretty long, so I guess we'll just say, and many many others. 2020 looks to continue this trend, with many remasters already being announced, the biggest game of January looking likely to be Warcraft 3 Reforged, and one of the biggest games of the year likely being the Final Fantasy VII Remake. As for whether all these reboots, re-releases, remasters and remakes are really a sign of the gaming apocalypse, well, I guess they're not. But they are one of the big changes that the 2010s have brought, and they are clearly a sign of the times, where original content is seen as risky, often too risky. The quality of all these remasters and remakes is also questionable. It's hard to begrudge a genuinely well-made remake of a classic game, or attempts to allow modern audiences easier access to older titles. But there have also been plenty of bad remasters, some borderline terrible, as well as some questionable new additions and changes. And even if there is real value in good remasters and good remakes, it's still hard not to miss the times when the gaming industry was just more original, innovative and experimental. The new technologies of the 2010s also haven't really seemed all that… transformative. We've seen attempts at augmented reality with Pokemon Go, 3D gaming with the Nintendo 3DS, and cloud gaming with services like OnLive at the start of the decade and Google Stadia at the end of it, and none of these have felt that important. And then there's the biggest no-show of the 2010s, virtual reality the technology of the future. And I guess it's a good thing that it is the technology of the future, because no one seems to care very much in the present. But hey, maybe things will change in the next decade, and maybe that's true for the other technology debutantes too. But if you compare this to the 2000s, which saw motion controls become a really big deal, as well as the introduction of touchscreens, and the start of online services for consoles that made online multiplayer mainstream, then the new technologies of the 2010s feel a uh, little unimpressive. It's as if we've barely begun to see their true potential, and it also feels like future technologies aren't going to explode onto the gaming world with a bang anymore, and instead seem to face a slow crawl to being successful, which may or may not even get there. And all in all, that's just one less thing to be excited about. So, over the last decade, technological progress has slowed, Video games have continually increased in costs, and developers and publishers have looked at other ways of generating revenue while also looking to create safer and safer products. And so, over the course of the last 10 years, it's hard not to feel that something has been lost within the industry. There are less classics, less optimism around big budget games, less diversity in those game types, and an overall sense that things were just better in the past that the glory days are gone, and that things will only get worse. Or at least, that would be the case, if it wasn't for a different side of the gaming industry. In 2008, Xbox launched their Xbox Live Summer of Arcade initiative, where during one summer month, five indie games were released exclusively on Xbox's virtual store. 
This was a smart move by Microsoft because it encouraged console gamers to start to transition to buying games digitally at a time when console gamers were used to only buying physical copies. However, this was also an important moment for the indie scene because the way this was marketed as a big exclusive event created a spotlight on some games that wouldn't have got that kind of attention otherwise. And there were some damn good games that featured in this summer of arcade. The first year saw the likes of Braid, Castle Crashers and Bionic Commando Rearmed, and this was followed by games like Shadow Complex, Trials HD, Limbo, Bastion and many many others. And suddenly it felt like indie games were legitimised. I mean there were plenty of other factors and things along the way. The rise of digital distribution pretty much went side by side with the rise of indie gaming, and there was also an important role played by those early breakout success stories like Cave Story, but at least in my eyes, 2008 Summer of Arcade felt like the start of something. It was when people took notice, when you started to see indie games make it into people's games of the year lists, and when people started to look at indie games as this separate part of gaming to the mainstream. Xbox's Summer of Arcade was initially a big success, and yet it was stopped after 2013 because it just wasn't needed anymore. I mean, that's not the official reason from Microsoft, I can't actually find an official reason, but come on, that's the reason. In 2008, indie games needed exclusivity and a specific month of the year dedicated to them to get people to pay attention, but in 2013, they didn't. By 2013, indie games could come out all year round, on all sorts of different platforms, and they'd be played by all sorts of different people, and they haven't slowed down since. Around the mid-2010s, there was talk of a saturation in the indie game industry. The term indie apocalypse was thrown around a lot, although we still seem to be waiting for that apocalypse to actually happen, so that doesn't seem a very accurate descriptor, but saturation seems pretty fair. Over the last 10 years, the indie scene has flourished, which has meant more and more games, and so, more and more competition. If you're an indie developer who gave up your day job to chase the indie dream, and who put all their capital into their beloved indie project, then the idea of indie saturation might be pretty disconcerting. Maybe it keeps you up at night and makes you question your life choices. But I'm not a developer, I'm a consumer. And if saturation means being spoiled for choice with so many good games you don't have time to play them all, then fuck, give me some more about saturation, because it doesn't seem so bad from where I'm standing. There have been a lot of good indie games this last decade, and the rise of digital distribution has been the main reason that this has happened, but it's not the only reason. The 2010s also saw the emergence of crowdfunding, thanks largely to the growth of Kickstarter. Kickstarter was a platform which allowed creators to pitch their projects directly to their target audience as a means of securing funding through donations. Thanks to some big names like Double Fine Productions and Obsidian Entertainment, Kickstarter garnered a lot of attention in the gaming industry, and with its promises to cut out publishers to allow more creative freedom and take gaming back to its glory days, it turned out to have a message that resonated with a lot of people. Throw in some cleverly crafted nostalgia where big name titles of the past, or big name people of the past, were name dropped and attached to projects, and you can start to see how some of these pitches amassed millions in pledges. So it was a time when people were longing for the past and funding developers directly did make some sense, and so a lot of games were crowdfunded this last decade and Kickstarter produced some huge successes, as well as a few notable failures. But most importantly, crowdfunding allowed for many games to be made which otherwise wouldn't have been. And while crowdfunding in video games seems to have peaked towards the start of the last decade, there are still crowdfunded games coming out today. But if you really want to see the success and importance of crowdfunding on the last decade, why not look at one of the smaller Kickstarter campaigns for a game that only asked for a modest $5,000? called Undertale. Undertale was developed almost entirely by one guy, a guy who learnt how to develop games through RPG Maker, and whose game almost looked like it could have been made in RPG Maker. But 
Undertale wasn't just a big success, it was the indie dream personified. It was a passion project made by one guy with limited funding or experience, which went on to become a gaming phenomenon and will leave a legacy remembered for years to come. For that reason, Undertale has to be considered one of the most important games of the decade, and it was financed entirely through crowdfunding. Another important thing which happened this decade was Early Access, where developers decided, why bother waiting to release a finished game when you can just release a unfinished game and still make people pay for it? Sounds like a bulletproof plan to me. For the developer, that is. <laughs> I mean, there might be a slight potential problem for consumers, which is that developers will receive players' money but have no actual obligation to finish the game. But I'm sure that would never ha- Oh. Oh dear. So, Early Access had its downside, and there was a lot of garbage Early Access titles as a result, but it also allowed for the ongoing development of games where community feedback could be incorporated by developers as the game was being developed. This has its advantages, particularly for indie developers who might struggle to test their game or incorporate player feedback prior to its release otherwise. Early Access also allowed for some really creative and ambitious projects. One personal favourite of mine was Kenshi, a game that started development in 2008, was released to Early Access in 2013, and then came out of Early Access at the end of 2018, almost six years later. And I don't know if you could quite describe this game as completely finished, but it's still great, and unlike anything I've played before. And it's exactly the type of game that wouldn't have been made without Early Access i.e. it's far too ambitious for its own good, but thanks to Early Access, it works. Other success stories of Early Access include the entire survival genre, which gave us games like DayZ, which gave us genres like Battle Royale, which gave us games like Fortnite, and I guess that's kind of a big deal. But the biggest thing to come out of Early Access and another game that surely has to be considered as one of the most important of the decade was Minecraft. First released in 2009, a time before the term Early Access had even been popularised, Minecraft was another game which initially came from a single person deciding to do their own thing. And Minecraft is the best-selling game of all time. And while it might have been bought up by Microsoft a while ago, it also looked and felt 100% like an indie game. Minecraft is a pretty good representation of what the last decade has been about, the fall from grace of the mainstream and its replacement by other things. We have just come to the end of 2019, and 2019 wasn't a particularly good year for AAA games, but it was a good year for indie games, and that statement feels like it could be applied to most of the last 10 years where mainstream gaming has been forced by changing economies to play it safe, the indie scene has instead basked in the creative freedom that a smaller budget affords its creator, where mainstream gaming has clung tightly to its established series and franchises, the indie scene often doesn't have a choice to do anything but create something original, and where mainstream gaming has abandoned the majority of genres, the indie scene can instead take advantage of these new gaps in the market or just create entirely new genres. And so the fall of one part of the industry has meant the rise of another. And as good as I think the past was, I'm not even sure I'd want to go back, because the sheer amount of choice today is unrivaled, and thanks to the internet, finding good games is easy. Even titles with small budgets and no marketing can become popular in the modern climate thanks to the platform provided by the internet to offer exposure to games that deserve it. This isn't exactly something that happens evenly or proportionally, but it does happen. I wonder how many people would have played Pathologic 2 this year if it wasn't for a couple of video reviews by one YouTuber who in a relative sense isn't even that big. The internet has helped to facilitate this indie gaming renaissance, but if we're talking about the decade in games, I guess we also have to admit 
The internet was a lot more than just that these past 10 years. So, the internet is a thing, and that means something for games. And you know, it was a thing last decade too, but now it's like, really a thing, so I guess we have to talk about that. The last decade has seen the internet grow in importance, with the number of people with internet access increasing, the number of people using social media increasing, and the number of people consuming video game related content also, unsurprisingly, increasing. Do you want your new game to sell? Well, maybe you should spend less money on buying adverts and stop worrying about traditional games media, and instead focus your attention on paying Twitch streamers and YouTube Let's Players, because that kind of digital marketing has become pretty important now, and a lot of the breakout success stories of these past years, particularly for indie games, have come about because of the exposure these games have received on platforms like YouTube and Twitch. But there's more to Twitch and YouTube than just being new spaces for marketing. It turns out, lots of people like watching other people play games, and the rise of this kind of content has had an effect on gaming culture. What's more, competitive gaming, in the form of esports, has also exploded in popularity, and is now seen as a fairly legitimate thing. It gets millions of views a year, it makes people huge amounts of money, and it even shows up on regular TV. Seeing video games on ESPN might have seemed pretty weird at the start of the decade, but by the end of it, it seems pretty normal. The internet has also facilitated the rise of freemium games, those which are free to play and make money through cash shops and other types of microtransactions. If you want to know where AAA Gaming got their ideas from, well, it was directly because of the success of this type of business model, and these days, freemium games make up a pretty big portion of the gaming industry's overall revenue. And, as much as you may personally wish it wasn't so, the 2010s were also the decade in which video games found their political voice. As an ever-expanding culture war spread across the internet, video games became one of its hottest battlegrounds, culminating in 2014's Gamergate, an event of such earth-shaking significance that we may never get to the point that online news outlets actually stop writing articles trying to milk it for every click it's worth. Gamergate set the fires of internet political discourse a-burning, and as we all know, fires aren't always that easy to put out. And so, particularly for games media, it's been a decade of arguing about politics. But it was also the decade in which games started to become overtly and deliberately political in their content, messages, and representation. And people have had a lot to say about that, both positive and negative. In fact, they continue to have a lot to say about that, and so it seems like video games will continue to be a political battleground moving into the next decade. Yay. And so, as the internet has grown in importance, so too has its impact on video games and video game culture. And while mainstream gaming has faltered and indie games have risen, the internet has sat in the background like a puppet master pulling the strings of change. So, what does all this mean? I feel like being all doom and gloom and pessimistic about everything is a popular thing for people to do on the internet, and I can be doomy and gloomy and I can say everything's terrible now and talk about the good old days when video games were better, but really, deep down I'm not sure I actually believe this decade has been that bad for video games, and I don't really think the end of the decade is a worse time than the start of it. So, mainstream gaming is a hollow shell of what it was in the 90s or the early or mid 2000s, and there are fewer good big budget games and fewer great big budget games, and what there is feels more formulaic, more safe, more similar, but maybe that makes the games that defy this stand out even more. There are still those big budget games that do feel different, that offer something new, or just feel so high quality that you can't help but be impressed. And there have been games that feel like they deliberately go against the grain, 
The 2010s were a decade where mainstream gaming became obsessed with making everything cinematic and with always holding the player's hand and making games easy to understand and difficult to fail. And so it seems fitting that one of the most successful and influential games this decade was Dark Souls, a title that did the complete opposite of all these things. And if I had to pick a game of the decade, it would be this one. Because Dark Souls and other titles released by From Software these past years weren't just well made and enjoyable games, they represented a complete defiance towards what mainstream gaming was meant to be, and it resulted in a series of games that resonated with players like few others, that spawned their own genre and countless imitators, which still keep coming out today, and which you know will continue to be a big influence on the gaming industry in the years to come. So great games, legendary games even, still exist and mainstream gaming's loss has also been indie gaming's gain. There are more games than ever before, more choice, more variety, and I think what really separates this decade from what came before in my eyes is that the burden to find good games, and find games that appeal to your specific tastes, is on you now. You can't just walk into your local game store and pick up a few of the top selling games and expect to find anything really memorable. You could, once upon a time, but times change, and now if you want to find good games, you'll have to search for them yourself. But with the internet, doing this is easier than ever before. You now have easy access to digital distribution, and easy to find information about huge numbers of games, so the burden to find these good games yourself doesn't seem unreasonable. And while we're on the subject of consumer responsibility, it also bears repeating that if you aren't happy with the state of modern mainstream gaming and modern publishers, it still doesn't mean anything unless your words are backed up with actions. It doesn't matter how many Jim Sterling videos you watched this year, or how many angry posts you upvoted on Reddit, if you still go out and give these companies you dislike money. Star Wars Battlefront 2 had the most downvoted post in Reddit's history, and it also sold millions of copies. And which of these things do you think EA cared more about? So, I guess we should end this all with a suitably cliched message that the future is in your hands, or something like that. But really, good games are out there, so make sure you don't overlook them. <laughs>